Page. We are here in the chapel at Mount St. Vincent University today, and my guest is John Shelby Spong, retired bishop of the Episcopalian Church uh, down in New Jersey in particular, also the author of Here I Stand. Welcome here to Canada. Thank you. Good to be with you. You are often described as being controversial. Yeah. Do you like that label? Well, I didn't like it when it was originally applied to me, but I've gotten used to it over the years, and uh, I think I even wear it as a badge of honor. I don't know how you can be a Christian and not be controversial, because it seems to me you've got to stand against any part of the life of the society that oppresses or denies the humanity of another person. Now, that took the form of, of uh, the struggle for equal rights for African Americans in the early part of my life. It took the form of, of a struggle for full inclusion of women in the life of the church and the society in a little bit later period of my life. It took the form of the battle for uh, the rights of gay and lesbian people to be full members of the society and of the church in an even later period of my life. And I think that all of these things are causes that I'm very proud to have been identified with. But when you're, and then some of them are controversial today. You know, it's not really controversial to say that women ought to have the vote and that women ought to have equal pay for equal work. That's not controversial today, but boy, it was at one point in our history. Do you believe that those battles are ever fully won? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know anybody today that wants to advocate slavery or even segregation. I think that once a, once a prejudice is put down, it never comes back. You'll never take the vote away from women. Uh, women will not uh, withdraw from the business arena. And gay and lesbian people, once they have come out of the closet, never go back in the closet. It's, uh, history doesn't work in that direction. You always work toward a more inclusive society. That's uh, very encouraging. Uh, one of your chapters is titled, The Heart Cannot Worship What the Mind Rejects. Could yeah. you describe that heart-mind relationship when it comes to religion? Yeah, uh, that was the title of a, of a lecture I gave to the House of Bishops earlier in my career when we were trying to relate uh, changing patterns in worship. Uh, what I mean by that is that Christianity uh, was shaped and formed in the first century in a Jewish context. Uh, that's why we have all kinds of Jewish phrases in our worship that most Christians aren't aware of. We, we describe Christ as our Passover. We refer to him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Those are right out of Jewish celebrations of both Passover and Yom Kippur. Uh, and Christianity was shaped by that world. Now, that world was okay for the first century, but that's not the world you and I live in. And when you're talking about uh, a religious message today and still assume a three-tiered universe, uh, which the Christian creeds assume, when you say the creeds, you find you're on a divine escalator that keeps going from heaven to earth to hell to earth to heaven to earth. It's a three-tier universe, a three-tier elevator. You and I are space age people, whether we like it or not. And there are also a lot of other images. I think one of the most important uh, that I tried to deal with is that the primary way that the Christian myth has been told is that, is that human beings were created good and then fell into sin and then needed a divine rescue operation to be restored to the goodness which they had originally. And that was the way we looked at the Christian story for uh, 1,800 years. But Charles Darwin came along in 1859, wrote a book called The Origin of Species, in which he, he didn't just uh, destroy the literal seven-day creation story, which is where the, the Christians by and large resisted him, but he really destroyed the myth because the, the, Charles Darwin said, human life was never created perfect and fell into sinfulness. Uh, we've been emerging for four and a half million or billion years from single cell life into very complex forms of consciousness. And so you don't need to be rescued from a fall that never happened so that you can be restored to a status you've never had. So the whole way we've told the Christian story, I think, is, is powerfully dated. And I don't believe that people will continue to be drawn to the story if they can't translate it. I would suggest that what we need to be telling people is that whatever there is that we have in the Christian story to impart to people, it is a call to step into a higher level of consciousness, a higher level of humanity, and not to be restored to something that, uh, from which you've fallen. 
And it means you've got to retell everything about the story. You've got to retell your understanding of God. You've got to retell your understanding of Jesus. And certainly the primary myth of the fall uh, becomes inoperative. Uh, now, that I think is the apologetic task that faces Christian people in, in the world that we live in. Now, it seems like uh, from reading your biography, your, uh, all, your entire adult life has been committed uh, to change in many forms, and you find yourself as the, the bishop of Newark, New Jersey. And I, I know Newark a bit, and I remember it as being um, a difficult place for people to live, a lot of poverty, a lot of inner city violence. Um, how did you bring some of those ideas to bear in the community, and what was the most difficult part of that job? Well, let me say first of all that the Diocese of Newark is all of northern New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And New Jersey is the second wealthiest state in the United States per capita, only behind Connecticut. It also is the state with the highest density of urban poverty. The five major urban areas of New Jersey are Newark, Jersey City, Patterson, Camden, and Trenton, and all of them are, are desperately poor, uh, isolated urban areas with enormous sorts of problems. So one of the tasks I had was to keep the people that live in the affluent parts of New Jersey aware of the problems of people that live in the inner city and to keep the dialogue between the two going. Uh, in the urban areas, the people are not concerned about esoteric theological issues. They're concerned about survival. But when you get out into the affluent suburbs, the real issues that they're talking about are issues of meaning and they are uh, fascinated by either what they perceive the Christian faith to be or what they would like for it to become. So I would find an audience for, th for the theological ideas out there. But in the inner city, I would find an audience for justice issues. And, and so we would work for justice for, for black Americans, for, for full inclusion of women, and for the full inclusion of gay and lesbian people. Yes. Um, you're you're um, teaching at Harvard University now, yeah. and that's quite a ways from Newark, but it's a much longer way from Tarboro, North Carolina. Take me back to the, the young man that you were as a minister in Tarboro right. back then, late 1950s. Yeah, I came out of seminary when I was at the ripe old age of 24 and was ordained and was quite sure that I knew everything that I would ever need to know. It took maybe a year and a half to have that uh, image of myself fully demolished by the world in which I lived. I moved to Tarboro at the ripe old age of 26. Everybody on the vestry of my church was old enough to be my father, and there were none of them that would have been mothers because it was an all-male vestry. Women were not welcomed in the church structures at that time. Tarboro was a city divided racially about 50-50. Uh, Panola Street divided black Tarboro from white Tarboro. And I had a church in both parts of Tarboro. I served a black congregation as well as a white congregation. And we lived through the civil rights period there. Uh, you know, I didn't march with Dr. King in Selma. I wish now in retrospect that I had had the courage to do that. Were you influenced by him at the time? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the civil rights movement was a very exhilarating movement for me. And you were what, there in the South. It was all yep. around you. We, well, I did my work locally. And, and I incurred the wrath of the KKK in Tarboro. They, they honored me by electing me public enemy number one at a big rally they held out in the cornfield just outside the city of Tarboro. And they accused me of a wide variety of things, from character assassination things to, to uh, they accused me of, of organizing the black young people to take over the food counters at the local drugstore, which was the way the, the sit-ins, that's the way the, the battle was fought in that period of time. And it was, a, it was a very dynamic period of life. It was a very difficult period of life. I really gave thanks at that point that I was an Episcopalian or an Anglican. And I don't mean to be promoting my particular tradition, but the nice thing about the Anglican tradition was that we had bishops who would support us uh, when we were being controversial people in the field. If you were in a congregational church, you were at the mercy of the approval of the congregation on any given issue. Uh, and I could be unpopular. Indeed, I was unpopular in the city of Tarboro but I had the ability and the support to stay there and, uh, and to see that battle through. Now, those were difficult days, and when I wrote about them, uh, you know, I can, still, I can still get sort of, uh, I can feel the chill of fear, because we would be harassed by telephone calls from the Klan in the middle of the night threatening to rape our daughters if we didn't stop this race-mixing stuff. Our daughters were something like eight, five, and three at the time, and the, the schools were desegregated for the first time. Four little children walked into these all-white schools. That's the way desegregation came. 
And you would have thought that, that the end of the world was coming by the fear and the anxiety. And, you know, I had a lot of friends that ceased being my friends. I would walk down the street and I would watch people cross the street so they wouldn't have to pass me on the public streets of that little town. Uh, I also served a black congregation, which was an enormous learning experience for me. It sounds uh, like a time of incredible change that you couldn't help but uh, become a different person as a result of. Of I course, think, you made some enemies along the way. I What's that that's fundamental true. difference between your views and uh, the views of Christian fundamentalists? Oh, goodness, uh, much in many ways, to quote the scriptures. Uh, the fundamentalists would start with an assumption that the Bible is the dictated word of God and that it is inerrant. Well, the Bible has been used in, not in my lifetime, but in history. The Bible has been used to oppose the Magna Carta and to support the divine right of kings. It's been used to condemn Galileo and to support the idea that the the sun rotates around the earth. It's been used to support slavery. It's been used to support segregation and apartheid. It's been used to, to affirm the fact that women were not created equally and therefore should not uh, come out of the, of the house and enter into the, to the world of, of commerce and business. It's been quoted to condemn homosexual people. Uh, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20 are the two favorite texts of fundamentalists. I believe the only two verses they know in the book of Leviticus because if they'd read the rest of the book, it would curl their hair because they don't observe most of the ordinances that yes. are in that particular book. But, uh, you know, I view the Bible, I view it as a very, in a very serious way. And I've studied the Bible every day of my life uh, since I was about 12 years old. I'm wondering if you believe the Bible is the literal word of God. Heavens, no. I can't imagine anybody that's been to a a theological seminary and been trained in the last 50 years could assert that. Uh, in the history of the Bible, it's been quoted to oppose the Magna Carta and to support the divine right of kings. It was quoted by the church fathers to condemn Galileo. The Vatican only in 1991 announced that they now thought Galileo was correct. I don't know that That's Galileo... That's a little bit after the fact. Yeah, I, I don't know that Galileo cares at this point yeah. what the Vatican thinks. But anyway, that was, I thought that was sort of interesting. Uh, the Bible was quoted to condemn uh, Darwin. The Bible was quoted to affirm slavery and segregation and apartheid. The Bible was quoted when women started uh, their agitation for equality in the life of this society. And the Bible was quoted quite accurately because women were property in the, in the, the Jewish world yes. when the Bible was written. Well, there's a wonderful story in the Bible itself where the devil quotes scripture to justify his point of view in a contention with Jesus out in the wilderness. The Bible is a wonderful book, and, and I treasure it, but I also think it's been used as a weapon of oppression in a wide variety of ways. Uh, today, the, the great battle that's rending religious institutions in the Western world is, is about how they will include gay and lesbian people in the full life of the society. And the Bible is quoted. They quote Leviticus 18 and 20. They, they quote uh, Genesis, uh, the Sodom and Gomorrah story. I think that's Genesis 19. They quote St. Paul talking in Romans 1. Uh, but you need, to, you need to understand that that book is written, the Bible is written between 1000 BC or BCE and 150 AD or CE, depending on which of those you like to use. And the, the level of knowledge in the world was very limited. Nobody would go to a doctor that hadn't read a medical textbook since that was written in that period of time. You just wouldn't do that. And you wouldn't, no scientific journals would be written there. What we know about homosexuality today, we've learned in the last 50 years in medical centers and in scientific centers. And there's an overwhelming consensus that homosexuality is a given and not a chosen in this world, and that it's more like being left-handed than it is anything else. Uh, it's something you awaken to. I didn't choose to be a heterosexual male. I just sort of awakened to the fact that girls weren't obnoxious anymore when that was about age 12 or 13. Before that, I was quite sure that girls were all obnoxious and I wouldn't want to associate with them. And then all of a sudden, I awakened to some new dimensions of life and I didn't know what was going on in me. Uh, my mother said the sap has risen. I didn't know what that meant either. But uh, that was the, that was, that's the way it is with sexuality. For heterosexual people to assume that gay and lesbian people wake up at some stage of their life and say, aha, I'll decide to be homosexual because I really like to be beat up and battered and murdered and fired and discriminated against, you know, it's inconceivable to me. But we're learning, and I think that battle is over. I was elated 
that just recently the rabbis of the reform movement in the United States came out and endorsed liturgies for the blessing of same-sex couples in the reform movement of Judaism. Now, all of the other churches will do the same thing in time. It's just a matter of working out their basic prejudice and understanding the knowledge that's available to them. And very dramatic changes. Now, many of uh, these ideas that you have come from experiences in your life, but I know that you've read very widely, too. Could you name just a few authors over the years who've been very influential? Oh, goodness. I have three primary heroes in my background. Uh, one is an English bishop named John A.T. Robinson, who wrote a little book called Honest to God that came out in 1963 that was quite revolutionary. I think so more books, more copies than any book since Pilgrim's Progress in the religious field. The second was uh, an American bishop named John Elbridge Hines, who really taught me a lot about integrity and about courage and about justice. Uh, John Hines never stopped to count the cost before he engaged an idea. He didn't worry about the unity of the church. He worried about the justice and the truth of the perception of, of the thing that he was interested in. And, and he really turned the church into being a very controversial and I thought liberating and wonderful institution. And the third was, a, was an English New Testament scholar named Michael Donald Golder, who taught at the University of Birmingham who did more for me to help me understand the Jewishness of the Christian story. Now, in terms of the gay and lesbian issue, uh, before I wrote on that subject, I went to the Cornell Medical Center in New York City, and I worked with doctors over there, and I read everything I could find to help me understand the origins of sexual orientation, not just homosexual orientation, but all sexual orientation. I didn't find a doctor over there that was not committed to the idea that it's a normal part of the human spectrum. It's present in about the same percentages in all cultures at all times, in all places. Uh, it's even present among the higher mammals. Uh, Time Magazine ran a story last March about homosexuality in the animal kingdom. They illustrated it with two male giraffes necking. Uh, if you're going to neck, to be a giraffe must be the most wonderful thing in the world to be. Yeah. And, and their necks were intertwined in this picture. It was a really graphic, uh, graphic picture. Now, that definition of homosexuality is seeping down into the body politic of the Western world. It certainly hasn't gotten into the third world much yet. And as it seeps down into the knowledge, the old definition that to be uh, homosexual was that you were either mentally ill or morally depraved is just dying. Now, the battle is being fought in the churches today, but it's, it's a winning battle. Uh, I think in the United Church of Canada, for example, uh, they've long ago sort of passed over that Rubicon. Uh, the Anglicans are a little bit behind in Canada, I think. In the United States, uh, the Unitarian Church is, is by far the most progressive. The, the United Church of Christ is right behind them. I think maybe the Anglican Church in the United States is probably next in line. But the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Lutherans are debating it. And even the Roman Catholics who don't debate things, you know, they wait for pronouncements to come down from, from, the Vatican, from the Vatican. Mm -hmm. But it is a debate going on in every crevice of the Roman Catholic Church privately. Yes. And, and it's, uh, it's, we're on the winning side of that issue, just a matter of time. We're going to take a short break right now. My guest is John Shelby Spong, and we'll be right back after this. Page. My guest today is Bishop John Shelby Spong. We're talking about his book, and in your book, uh, you've written this. My vocation is to free people from the clutches of religious systems that create a false security, provide a phony peace, and pretend to solve profound questions of life with simplistic answers. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Sounds like wonderful rhetoric. Yes. I'm, I'm glad it. I wrote that. Yes. Uh, religion is a funny thing. There's a difference between the God experience and the way you organize the God experience institutionally in your life. I think people are profoundly religious uh, at all times and in all places. But what happens is that a system develops that sort of takes that internal yearning and begins to codify it and then to say, now this is what you've got to do in order to please God. And you get all sorts of uh, strange and, and unusual things. I happen to think that, that what Christianity does for me is not to give me security. 
because I think if you're secure, you aren't really human. I think to be human is to be anxious and to be afraid and to be, uh, to be caught up in the, in the insecurities of life. And what I think Christianity should give us is the courage to step into the insecurities and to know that's part of our humanity and to luxuriate in it and to, to confront it head, headlong. Uh, if, if Christianity takes my insecurity away from me, I think it takes my security away from me. And what I find in religious people, and deep down I don't like religious people, and that's a bit of an occupational hazard for someone in my profession, but I find religious people are the kinds that that lose their selfhood inside a religious system. And what I want them to do is to find their selfhood and, and to celebrate their humanity. And that's not exactly easy for a lot of organized churches to, to embrace. Uh, well, the, your book before <coughs> this was called uh, Why Christianity Must Change or Die. Yeah. Uh, that must have scared a lot of people. Just I'm sure it time. did. But let me tell you that the response to that book was greater than the response to any book I've ever written. Uh, now, I, I don't know how to compare the most recent one with that, but up until that time. And the response was twofold. Uh, I averaged getting 100 letters a week for 60 weeks after that book came out. I have a total of 6,000 letters within the first year and a quarter. Now, that's an astronomical number of letters to be written to an author. Uh, and the, the letters fell in an interesting direction. They were about three to one positive. Most of my mail is from is negative because I'm really pushing yes. the edges of the church's life and those feeling pushed are the ones that write the letters, but not with this book. Desmond Tutu says that you have been frequently bis been misunderstood. Yes, That's well, quote about Desmond about is you. a very good friend. Yeah. Uh, but but in, the, in the mail, uh, the positive letters were overwhelmingly from lay people. They were from lay people who, many of whom had left the church and joined what I call the Church Alumni Association. Many of them were hanging on by the skin of their teeth. Some came from parts of what we call the Bible Belt in the United States, where, where they say, I wouldn't dare raise these questions down here in Alabama, but I really did like what you had to say. I just keep silent because it's, it's too painful to sort of raise questions in this particular culture. Now, they were enormously appreciative letters, and they, they tend to tell me their life history of their relationship with the church and how they had tried to raise questions when they were children and were told that they should never question that because that was to, to violate the truth of the gospel or whatever. The negative letters, about one out of every four were negative, and they were overwhelmingly from ordained people. Now the fascinating thing to me about that was that these ordained people who certainly felt threatened by what I had to say don't seem to know that this audience to whom this book was very appealing even existed. And that's one of the problems that the church has. The church speaks only to the religious few. It has abandoned that great horde of people who have sort of voted with their feet and walked out of the church into the secular society. I consider myself sort of a bishop to the exiles, uh, and I think that's an important role. I wish the church would concentrate on the people that are not in the church. We concentrate on the people that we still have. And I think that's exactly the wrong thing for us to be doing. We try to create security patterns so that the people we have won't be disturbed. And in the process, we alienate the next generation. We're going to take a very short break here on Off the Page, and we'll be back right after this. today. My guest is John Shelby Spong. Uh, his book is called Here I Stand. Uh, in this book you suggest that faith and reason need not be so far apart. How can you bring the two back together? Well, I, th I think that if faith is faithful and if reason is truthful, that they will always come together. So I think that agitation and controversy is actually good for the institution, and I think it's being faithful to the cause of Christ. Bishop Spong, thank you for being on the show. It's a pleasure to be with you. And thanks for watching Off the Page. I'll see you again next time.